Welcome to Shades of Migraine, a podcast series created by the Association of Migraine Disorders. We hope you'll enjoy listening to a wide variety of voices, including the perspectives of people living with migraine and those that are trying to help. Each will share their unique shade of migraine. Teva is committed to the goal of transforming the lives of those suffering from migraine by creating solutions to reinvent the migraine paradigm by placing people at the center of everything they do. You can visit www.moretomigraine.com for tools and resources for living with migraine. In this episode, Dr. Shivang Joshi from the Dent Neurologic Institute gives us scientific and practical information about the use of cannabis or marijuana for treating migraine. Originally geared towards physicians, this 20-minute presentation is chock full of information helpful for anyone using or contemplating using cannabinoids to treat their migraine disease or chronic pain. Um, Thank you, Rick, for inviting me here. It's been a pleasure to be part of this organization. It's my second time uh, participating. And, um, you know, today I'm going to talk about a topic that's fun, but yet it's also a little controversial. Uh, I grew up in the 80s, so I was thinking about you know, uh, giving the title "Hope with Dope," but then I thought about stigma, and decided to keep it to uh, keep it to just cannabinoids. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, terminology. I'm going to talk about pharmacology. I'm going to talk about pathogenesis. I'm going to talk about some clinical research, and um, as well, in, in particular, Rick asked me to talk about physician uh, clinician expectations and also patient expectations. And they're going to briefly mention some cutting-edge research that we're doing at Dent, which has a large, um, it's a large practice to begin with, but we also are involved in um, medical marijuana or cannabis. So basic term- terminology, marijuana is frequently uh, uh, you know, thought of to be a synonym for cannabis, but it's not. The terms are different. Cannabis is the botanical term uh, for the hemp plant uh, that contains cannabis sativa. Cannabis sativa is different from cannabis indica. So cannabis sativa is a tall, lastly branched uh, with long and narrow leaves. There's a picture of it there on the bottom right corner. This provides more of the high feeling, the energetic buzz feeling. It's up deal, uplifting feeling. The ratio of uh, THC to uh, CBD uh, is, it has more of a THC component versus uh, CBD. I'm going to explain uh, those uh, molecules in a second. And recreational users, users typically uh, seek this train to get um, more of the high feeling. Cannabis indica comes from India. It was uh, found there in the Hindu Kush mountain range as well. Uh, these are short conical dense uh, branches with broad leaves. Provides more of a stoned feeling and uh, people uh, also use it for sedation, pain relief and anxiety benefits as well. Uh, there's a slightly different THC to CBD ratio and typically medical users uh, prefer this strain over the other one. Uh, in terms of history, it's been around for thousands of years. It's uh, actually even mentioned in the Ebers uh, papyrus uh, with some uh, use for pain-related disorders. But um, one of the earliest known uh, use has been found in China, and uh, plant stems were used for ropes and linen, uh, flower seeds, especially the resin um, can be sort of uh, extracted to uh, give uh, psychoactive chemical properties termed cannabinoids. So the different types of cannabinoids, endocannabinoids are endogenous. These are uh, lipid-based neurotransmitters. Uh, one of the first discovered was uh, anandamide, and I'm going to mention that a little bit later when we talk about pathogenesis. Uh, phytocannabinoids, these are the ones listed here. These are come from more of a natural uh, base and then synthetic cannabinoids. These are FDA approved. These two in particular are FDA approved for the treatment of nausea and and um, uh, severe nausea sh- associated with cancer related pains. Uh, these synthetic cannabinoids that are FDA approved have more uh, of a regulation in terms of the actual compound itself uh, versus the synthetic cannabinoids that are out on the street. Um, these are manufactured by chemists, chemists, and their chemical structure has changed. So there have been some warnings associated with that, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later on. So uh, there are synthetic cannabinoids that are approved, approved by FDA, and then there are other ones that people buy online, and their structure is actually modified. They're not um, coming from natural plants. So just to uh, know some of that terminology. In terms of the pharmacology, um, tetrahydrocannabinol was first identified in 1964. Uh, by Mechelum, 
And by smoking, uh, in, in one cigarette or joint, you can contain about 0.5 to 1 gram of uh, cannabis. Uh, only about 20% is absorbed in the lungs. It's rapidly metabolized in the liver. You can also have, um, because of its solubility, you can have accumulation in fat taking place. That's why you can even detect it in the urine two weeks uh, down the line as well. Oral consumption can produce a, a prolonged uh, but poor absorption. So some people who uh, may try something orally and don't feel the effect will keep eating and then later on they just are completely wiped out because of the delayed effect. Uh, more on pharmacology. So there's uh, several primary cannabinoids uh, from cannabis. So there's cannabidiol, CBN, um, cannabid I'm sorry, uh, cannabinol, cannabidiol, which is CBD, and tetrahydrocannabinol. So THC has more of the psychoactive property. CBN is about one tenth of the psychoactive property as THC, and CBD has no uh, real psychoactive property. Adverse effects of marijuana. So on the left, you can see some of the short-term effects, which include uh, memory impairment, motor coordination, altered judgment, uh, motor vehicle accidents, sometimes even psychosis and paranoia. On the right side, it's somewhat controversial. It's debatable. So I'm not going to really delve in, uh, too much into that. That area is still controversial in terms of long-term effects of heavy use. Who uses marijuana? There are patients, people who use it for recreational. They also use it for medical reasons. And some use it for both as well. Now, what's in marijuana? Marijuana contains hundreds and maybe more different cannabinoids. So here's a breakdown of several different cannabinoids. CBD, focusing on that in particular, has several different properties. Antibacterial, inhibits cancer cell growth, neuroprotective benefits, promotes bone growth, reduces sugar levels, all these other ones that are listed here um, that you can see. Where, where are the CB1 receptors? There are several different parts of the brain. So it's the medulla, which is involved, which has a chemoreceptor trigger zone, the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, cerebral cortex, the hypothalamus, and the hippocampus, as well as the spinal cord. Now, I like this article. It was published in the Green Journal. It's not that Green Journal. It's a different Green Journal. And um, I like this because it really talks about uh, pathogenesis. And, and right now, we, we know a lot about uh, migraine pathogenesis. And we, we know because of the newest you know, uh, information on neuroinflammation. So it's really interesting is if you look at the research that's already existing out there with cannabinoids uh, and where it potentially affects the receptors, there's a parallel between migraine pathophysiology as well, too. For example, systemic effects. Uh, there are variants in the CNR1 gene, which encodes for a uh, cannabinoid 1 receptor, which results in de decreased expression of CB1 associated with migraines and the trigemin trigeminal vascular activation. We know that the trigeminal vascular system and the trigeminal cervical complex all play a big role in uh, migraine pathogenesis. We have peripheral and central activation of those two. Um, there's been some research on people who have deficiency in endocannabinoids, and uh, particularly anandamide, uh, and possibly there's a relationship between that and the pathogenesis of migraines too. That's still an area that needs further research as well. If you take a look at the cortex, you have CB1 agonists that suppress glutamate neurotransmission by inhibiting NMDA, re NMDA receptors. Um, you also have CB1 receptors that re uh, suppress cortical spreading depression, which is a precursor for migraines. In the vasculature, you can see that um, there's some effect on blood vessels and, and effect on blood vessel dilation induced by CGRP, uh, as well as capsaicin and nitric oxide. In addition, you have anandamide that is an agonist or activates uh, TRIP-V1, which is involved in also trigeminal uh, vascular activation. TRIP-V1 is another area of future study. It's actually being currently studied and a potential target for uh, future migraine treatments. So it's exciting to see that uh, cannabinoid uh, research actually parallels some of this as well. There's some effect on platelets as well. And in relation to platelets, there is some research with 5-hydroxytryptamine uh, or 5-HT uh, receptor and, um, and migraines. In the brainstem, so we know that there's a peripheral activation. There's also a central activation of migraines, which involves ascending pathways that go through the periaqueductal gray, the thalamus, the cortex, and there's uh, descending pathways that go down as well, too. And persistent activation of these pathways lead to something called allodynia, which was, I think, mentioned earlier in some of the rat models. So what's been shown is that CB1 receptor 
actually is involved in, with activation of the paraaqueductal uh, gray area and also the rostral ventral uh, medial medulla as well. So here's a quick chart that looks at all this sort of combined together. Uh, this concept of endocannabinoid deficiency, which some people may have a genetic predisposition to or um, have a genetically uh, may have that. Um, results in increased glutamate signaling, which may lead to cortical spreading depression uh, as a potential aura migraine trigger. And basically what I just said is summarized in this diagram here. Now, why is it difficult to do research? Because um, it's still listed as a Schedule One drug, uh, including some of those other agents. I know Dr. Uh, Goschalk back there is doing some research, and uh, he might be able to provide some insight uh, just one on with LSD, I believe. So uh, he might be able to elaborate how difficult it is to do something like that. So it's, it's not an easy process. So that's one of the challenges to doing research on cannabis or cannabinoids is because of the, the scheduled nature of it. Um, other research includes, the current research includes that most of the trials in the U.S. are retrospective studies. Um, so these are, you know, uh, there are no prospective trials where we actually give patients medication and, and follow them through. Uh, but there are some European ones which I'm going to highlight just one quick abstract on. Uh, the, most of the ones that are uh, existing right now are very short, not enough uh, patients, um, and a lot of confounding factors in those studies which include tobacco use and comorbid illness as well. So. I, I practice in New York State, so right now the approved uses for uh, medical cannabis is uh, cancer and all these other ones that are listed. The newest one that was just added not too long ago is PTSD. So I actually looked up Rhode Island and Rhode Island has a very similar approve, approval for uh, these disorders as well. Recently, Rhode Island had a uh, Department of Health sent an advisory, and this was through other states as well. And this had, in particular, due to the synthetic cannabinoids. These are produced, these are, you can buy these online. And what some of these people that manufacture them um, were changing the chemical structure. So they actually added something that was uh, making it uh, cause increased uh, bruising. Uh, it was uh, affecting vitamin K. So. Just to be aware of uh, issues with synthetic cannabinoids that you can buy online. There are also legal issues, and these vary by state, so I would encourage you to look up things in your own state. You can't travel out of your state for the most part. You can't drive with it. There's risk of DUI. Laws allow federal employees to fire uh, for positive drug tests, whereas there may be some protection with state employees as well. Um, and it cannot be used in certain institutions, such as group homes, nursing homes, or hospitals. So what I mentioned before, some of the limitations of retrospective clinical trials is that you know uh, there's limited data from that that we can we can use. So I found something you know uh, a recent uh, uh, um, meeting that took place in the Amsterdam, and it was uh, some German research which has a little bit more liberal uh, rules in terms of research. Uh, it was a prospective study, a small study where they took some migraine patients and cluster patients and initially gave them uh, THC, uh, one group, and another group had uh, CBD only. They found that it required higher doses and resulted in about 55% improvement in overall frequency and severity. Uh, the second phase, they gave uh, the migraine patients amitriptyline and also uh, THC-CBD combination, and they found uh, an improvement as well. What's interesting about this is that in the cluster headache patients, the only patients that improved were the ones that had some background uh, history of migraines as a child as well. So this is a very limited study. And I only have this in the abstract form. It's just to highlight that uh, a prospective trial is, is more, you know, it gives us more data than a retrospective trial. So just to comment about what's going on at DENT, um, the cannabis clinic, these are the number of uh, patients that we've seen so far uh, in, a, in a year or a year and a half period. Majority of the patients are being treated for chronic pain. 69%, um, approximately about 30 to 40% of those, about 30% of those are uh, chronic migraine patients. This data is from Dr. McVig, who's one of the leading researchers on concussion, and she actually has one of the largest population of um, concussion patients, about 800 in, in one particular study that she's undergoing right now. So in a subset of, of one of her studies, she's actually studying uh, in, in about 149 individuals with chronic pain who were certified uh, for medical cannabis, and they were given concussion-related diagnosis of post-concussive syndrome. 
she was using five sort of pillar, pillars as a treatment modality. So these were mood, sleep, headache, dizziness, and um, concentration issues. And what she found was that uh, there were three of these had, had more significant improvement over a period of time with medical cannabis use versus not. And these were, there was an 80% improvement in mood and 78% with sleep and 76% with headache. So the, and that's one of the findings. The second important finding in this particular study, so this study is published in the abstract form and it's, uh, it's submitted for a publication as a, in a journal. And further analysis of this, of this study are being done uh, right now as well too. So 80% of the patients experienced significant improvement in activity uh, limitations, symptoms, emotions, and quality of life. This is not showing us clearly, but it's showing you that there was uh, an improvement in quality of life. Pre-medical cannabis use uh, was 27%. Post-medical cannabis use, it was 43%, so there's an improvement. It was statistically significant. There's further analyses being done with this particular study, so stay tuned. In fact, she's actually presenting this at the um, American Academy of Neurology concussion meeting that's taking place uh, later on. Another um, finding from this study was the optimal dosing um, was a byproduct, uh, a combination of THC to CBD, a one-to-one -one ratio, with a combination of a tincture dose three times per day. And um, the inhalation component was a 20 to one ratio as a vapor pen, and this is more used as an immediate relief, uh, which, which is not used all the time, but just more of a breakthrough pain. The cost was 269 per month, which is a little bit high, but the cost of this varies from state to state as well, too, and hopefully this will decrease over time. The, the last finding of this particular study was 14% of the patients reported side effects. All were minimal, and 70% were, um, were related to uh, administration route, whether it was dry mouth or cough, so this was fairly tolerated. So how do you go about doing this? I mean, uh, not too many places have a cannabis clinic. First, you have to contact your physician. They have to be certified. They have to certify you. Uh, and then you get registered. You apply for a card. You get a registration. Then you go to a dispensary to purchase your product. So what are some provider expectations? So maintenance of CBD products takes about two weeks to, uh, of regular use before patients can start to notice any relief of symptoms. Uh, the change in cannabis ratios uh, should be done in two to three month, in, month intervals, increments. Um, cannabis is dose dependent and cost, cost prohibitive, so it does cost more the more you use. So, um, you know, patients aren't, you know, they, they, they want to minimize use and at least and, and get the most uh, bang for their buck as well, too, so they might um, adjust some of their dosing on their own. Um, taste of tinctures may restrict use as well, too. Uh, the vaporization is contraindicated for COPD and asthma. Some drug interactions to be concerned about. So opioids, you may need to decrease the uh, opioid dose as well, too. Uh, one thing to know is that some of these patients that are coming in with you, the, you may not feel comfortable giving them medical cannabis if they're on a high dose of opioids. So you have to coordinate with pain management to help them titrate down their dose. Now, if you feel comfortable doing that, you can do that, but I think most uh, clinicians uh, feel more comfortable with whoever's originally prescribing them to lower their dose. There's a lot of active research going on now with the use of medical cannabis and getting people off of opioids, so that's another area of study, and there's a big need for that as well, too. So stay tuned for that research to come out as well. Um, you may need to decrease the anxiolytic dose as well, too. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants, they have sedative effects. Uh, monitor increased side effects of SSRIs. Antiretrovirals, there may be um, enzyme in inhibition or inducing effects related to that. And seizure meds as well may need to be adjusted due to the pharmacodynamic uh, uh, related changes. Now, establishing patient expectations. So uh, this, de this depends on the amount of prophylactic products the patients are going to use and their ability to afford their products. A lot of the patients that we're seeing are not able to afford some of the products at the dispensaries at the rate right now. So that's one of the limitations. So what some of them wind up doing is they get approved, they wind up using um, their or smoking marijuana. So that's something to be uh, aware of as well too. Um, patients may have some reduction in migraine associated symptoms, but this may take time. CBD maintenance, so it does reduce uh, muscle pain, anxiety, improve sleep. Um, the increase in tincture dose must be done slowly to prevent uh, any adverse effects such as dizziness 
and uh, drowsiness. Um, it can take about two weeks to uh, develop any kind of consistent use of CBD to notice any positive effects. Once again, um, THC uh, provides more immediate pain relief, and this is more done in the form of a, a vape form as well, too. So this is going to be important. They can't take this to work. They can't drive within six hours after use. It will create a high, and it may worsen anxiety or, or paranoia. Just a few more slides. I don't know how we are on time. Uh, we're way over. Yeah. Way, okay. So, um, all right. So there, there's improvement that takes over time. Uh, you need to set these realistic expectations with these patients. This I got from the, the Rhode Island Department of Health, just to show you what people are doing in Rhode Island. So. Uh, this is the data from 2016 to 17. There's about 4,500 patients that are been, being treated for chronic pain, and those are some of the other indications. And who's writing this in Rhode Island? Majority are internal medicine, family medicine, and not so much neurology. Uh, further research needs to be done. I want to thank uh, Dr. Laszlo Metzler, who's leading the campaign at uh, Dent. Dr. McVig, who provided some of the research data on the concussion, and Cheryl Lyon, who's a nurse practitioner, who's very much involved with uh, patient and uh, clinician expectations. Thank you. Teva is committed to the goal of transforming the lives of those suffering from migraine by creating solutions to reinvent the migraine paradigm by placing people at the center of everything they do. You can visit www.moretomigraine.com for tools and resources for living with migraine. Migraine Monitor is an intuitive headache tracking app with a unique opportunity to connect you to your headache specialist, prepare insightful reports, and invite you to an anonymous support group. Text MIGRAINE to 41411 to download Migraine Monitor today. And thank you for tuning in to Shades of Migraine. For more information about migraine disease, please visit migrainedisorders.org.